And we're live. Guys, welcome to my channel. Of course, you know it's committed to helping you break into tech sales and take advantage of the opportunity. I'm sorry, my puppy's uh, squeaking her toy. A little donut here. Um, you know this channel is committed to helping you break into tech sales, but at its core, tech sales is just a vehicle to um, experiencing mental, emotional, and financial freedom. And this channel wants to support you and guide you on that path and journey. And when we talk about achieving mental, emotional, and financial freedom, one key factor is overcoming adversity and another is being successful as an entrepreneur. And Logan Sneed, my guest here and one of my good friends, he overcame brain cancer. I don't know if adversity can get any scarier than that. And he's built a highly successful coaching business. So Logan, thanks for joining today. We're going to talk about the tools and the mindset he used to get out of the biggest hole you could be in. We're going to talk about how he's built a very successful um, coaching business, even look at it from a sales perspective as well. And of course, you'll have an opportunity to connect with him and check out what he's doing. So, um, you know, make sure to stay for the whole thing. If you enjoy this video, give that like button, the love tap. The YouTube algorithm loves that too. And it'll show this video to more people who could benefit from the message. Come on and hit that subscribe button too for weekly sales, mental health, and personal growth hacks that you can chew on like snacks and more great interviews with people like Logan. I'm done rambling. Logan, thanks for being here. And yeah. can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your story and maybe even paint a picture of what rock bottom looked like for you? Yeah, yeah. Feel free to interrupt me as I go along because it's a very, very long story altogether. But yeah, dude, I'm a, I'm a six-year brain cancer survivor. Uh, literally exactly six years ago, almost exactly, um, I was diagnosed with the stage four glioblastoma brain tumor. I was driving down the road, going to the gym one day, I decided to FaceTime my, my girlfriend at the time, just out of the blue. I don't know why I did it. I don't know what made me do it. It was just one of those once in a lifetime things. Cause I never like, I never, I never have FaceTimed while driving. And I don't think a lot of people do that, but suddenly in my mind, I just decided to do that. And then boom, as I'm doing that, I started having a seizure. Um, <clears throat> so wow. I drove half a mile unconscious. She saw me seizing onto, on my phone and Thankfully, I drove, I drove into a ditch. Um, there was no injuries, no really no car damage at all. Um, and then I was immediately taken to the hospital because she knew where I was going. So she was able to call, call the ambulance and everything. Um, but I go into the hospital and they were like, you know, asking my parents questions. Is he on drugs? Does he do this and that? And they're like, no, I mean, we've never seen this before. And they were like, okay, well, the only thing that we can really do to make this out and figure out what's going on is do an MRI. So I did an MRI, came back and this thing was a huge, huge, they called it a mass. They didn't call it a tumor or this or that. They just called it a mass because they couldn't determine what it was, but it was the size of an egg. Basically it was a perfect egg sitting in my head and it was huge. So when they saw that, they said, Hey, look, this is, this is big. He's going to have to get, or he's going to have to talk to a neurologist. And so literally the next day I go and see a neurologist um, and the neurologist said, wow, uh, you're going to have to definitely see a brain surgeon and that brain surgeon, he told me, he said, Hey, Mr. Sneed, like this tumor looks like it's in an area of your brain that could potentially cut off your speaking and hearing ability after the surgery. So do you want to get surgery and lose that and, you know, potentially live longer, or do you want to just keep it there and keep that ability, but potentially live less or shorter period? So that was a very like just shot in the face. This is all within 48 hours of feeling incredible in life to now, boom, suddenly like in a near death situation um, or a complete 180 in my life. And so whenever I, after that, sur or after that uh, meeting, that surgeon, my parents are like, we're not going to see that guy. That guy, there's no desire to help. He doesn't want to fix the problem. He just wants to be of service, right? There's a difference between fixing a problem and there's a difference between being of service, right? There's I'll give you an example. Like people can be an editor for a video any day, any time. Like I could make videos any day, any time, but a lot of people just do it to be of service. They don't do it to maximize what is being edited to the best of ability to see better results. Right. So I ended up seeing a way, but way, way, way better brain surgeon. Um, he's known as like the number one brain surgeon in the world. His name is Dr. Raymond Sawaya. And I saw this guy and I said, look, doctor, Am I going to be able to speak or hear if I get this brain surgery? And he was like, oh, easy. 
don't even worry about it, man. That's not even a problem. I'll make this happen. Don't even sweat it. You'll be fine. And I was like, whoa. I was like, because this is this is not just like a who's going to win the game. This is like a life or death situation. And one guy's like, man, not going to go so hot. And this guy's like, mm, easy, easy money. So I was like, holy crap. Like, it's like, this is completely different. So obviously I went with this guy and he said, hey, <clears throat> but we're going to have to have surgery probably tomorrow morning. And I saw him at like, I think 8 a.m. in the morning. He was like, we're going to have to have surgery in about 10 hours. So about 6 a.m. in the morning. And he said, hey, it's going to be about it. It's going to be about an eight hour long surgery. Uh, you will be a, you will be knocked out, but then you'll be waking up in the middle of the surgery and then you'll go back to sleep or go go back to knockout, whatever unconscious. So I go through training this whole day, literally like six hours of just like training just to like, you know, you know, okay, touch your nose. Okay. Now write out what you see here and blah, 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 blah. Like all these little things just to see that if I was still functional. And then I go, I go to bed and I'm like patched up, you know, I got like all these like stickers and like drawing on my face as I'm going into the surgery. And I wake up at like 5am in the morning and I'm like going into this surgery and I'll never forget, I, I go into the hospital at such an early time in the morning. I didn't, I didn't suspect anybody to be there, but I go down this, like this, this, this hall and on each side, like as I'm going down the hall, it's almost like a church setup, right? So you go down the, you go down the aisle, and you got all these rows, right? At a church. This one was like, you're going down the aisle and there's like section here, section here, 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 here. And then right here at the very front is the registration to get signed up and, you know, check in for your surgery or whatever. And as I'm walking down here, it's pitch black, dark, pitch black, dark. It's like six at five 30 in the morning. There's a family here, a family here, 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 and here, and here, and here. And as you walk down, you look to your sides, everybody's bawling their eyes out. Everybody's freaking out. Everyone's absolutely going through so much anxiety because this person's getting surgery. This person could be dead. This person already died. This person, geez, who knows what's going to happen here. So it's just an absolute depressing environment. Um, so I go in there. I get on the stretcher. They sign a waiver. I sign a waiver, obviously. And they go in. They bring this pastor to say a prayer like, hey, you know, God forbid, like this could not maybe go so well. This, this could happen, right? But hey, whatever. So I go in there. I get the surgery. They wake me up in the middle of the surgery to ask me questions. Um, I'll never forget that moment when they asked me those questions. And um, then they put me back to sleep and then the surgery was done. And so when, when surgery was done, good news came back and said, hey, this whole thing was removed. 100 percent. Fully removed, not a trace thing, not a trace of it left that we know of. Um, and I was like, sweet. Life goes on like problem solved. Cool story. Good stuff. Life goes on. I didn't think much of it. I just thought it was like gone. So if it's gone, I'm like cool, it's gone. Right. And so then they're like, okay, we well, have to come in back in, in about two weeks to see what the, what the diagnosis is. Uh, but we'll let you know. So I come back in two weeks later. I didn't again, I didn't think much of it just cause it was fully gone. Right. If it's out, if it's gone, it's gone. So what else am I supposed to think of it? Um, and so I come back and she said, Hey, this is a stage four glioblastoma brain tumor. And if anybody knows what those things are, it's the most deathly cancer there is. It is the fastest growing cancer. And it is the least funded cancer in the world. So like this is a cancer that people just don't talk about because of how bad it is and how fearful people are when they get it. So people just don't, I don't want to say people don't stand up for it. It's just so deathly that people just kind of ignore it and just kind of go to the ones that are more curable, more, you know, more people can, you know, actually overcome. So she said, hey, it looks like your life, like life expectancy is one to 10 years. We can't do anything about this. We'll take you through chemo. We'll take you through radiation. Uh, but there's nothing that we can do. And I'm very sorry to tell you that. So when I had this doctor who's, if you don't know what a neuro-oncologist is, just look it up because it is the most insane job that you could possibly ever get. I mean, that is like the most difficult job in the world. You're studying the brain every single day. Like that's, a, that's so difficult. So when people who have this sort of job, that's the most difficult job in the world. And they say, Hey, I know a lot about the brain, but shoot, I can't do anything about it. Like, sorry, I tried. Like when they tell you that, like, what am, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to be like, Oh yeah, forget that doc. I mean, shoot, I'm smarter than you anyway. So I'll figure this out. No, like, I'm like, oh, like, okay. So is that it? Like, you just don't do anything. Like, so in that talk, my dad was like, okay, is there any food he could eat? 
food he shouldn't eat, like no sugar, sugar, like what do you think? And she's like, I'm sorry, just not, nothing's going to work. I mean, like, you know, it's just not going to do anything. And he was like, okay, so a beer and a burger, like if you just went to go eat trash, like that's fine. She's like, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's just not going to do anything for the better or for the worse. And I left there and I was just absolutely mind blown because she said I'll be dead soon. She said she can't do anything about it. So I'm like, then who the hell do I ask to get help from? Like nobody, like nobody's going to help. Right. So what do I do? So I felt absolutely lost. I literally, I mean, I never had like suicidal thoughts. I just had thoughts of like, I'm ready to die. And I was just kind of waiting for that to happen. Um, and so I just kind of put everything that I ever dreamed of. I just put it kind of aside and just kind of thought in my mind, like I'm, I might be dead tomorrow. I might be dead next month. I, I don't know. I'll just kind of let it go. And so um, it was a very saddening time, obviously. And in a two week period, you know, my parents were doing research on other things that could potentially help. I wasn't doing research. I was just ready to die. Um, but then I ended up going out here to the Ladybird Lake, Austin River here, um, right outside my window. It's pretty cool. And I go on, I go paddleboarding with a friend of mine. And uh, he said, Hey, dude, so have you heard of the ketogenic diet? And this was like, this is six years ago. So this is when like hardly anybody knew what it was. <clears throat> I was like, never heard of that. What is that? He's like, okay, it's a low, it's a high fat, medium protein, low carb diet. You should definitely check it out because it does have research that it could potentially shrink tumors or prevent tumor regrowth. And I think you should really look into this. And I was like, okay, sure. And I really looked up to this guy. He was like my mentor, everything. So I went home that night. I literally looked it up, ketogenic diet, and it said you can help you lose body fat, maintain muscle, uh, you know, have mental clarity, starve cancer, prevent tumor regrowth, you know, cure or fix your skin, like all these crazy things. And I was like, okay, I'm sold. I'm sold, whatever. So literally the next day I just started the ketogenic diet, never second guessed it, never doubted it, didn't know what I was really doing. I just had to figure it out. And as I go through, I end up seeing crazy results in my body. Like I ended up losing like 30 pounds and literally got the most lean that anybody could possibly ever get. Like I could send you pictures to just put on here if you want, but like it was so insanely lean that I went viral. And I was showing how I was doing this in the middle of chemo and radiation. And people were like absolutely freaking out. They're like, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. It's this thing called keto diet, whatever that is. And they're like, no, you're just making that up. And I was like, no, I don't know. I just, you know, I just kind of saw some research like, no, scam, scam. You're just making this up. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. It's just called keto diet. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe I am. I don't know. But it ended up going viral. People were asking me what I'm doing. So I was like, like maybe let me just build something that I can just sell because I'm <clears throat> doing I'm doing something that's changing my life so maybe they'll want it I don't know and so then I was in college and I ended up doing this and I'm, I'll never forget my first my first person who signed up sold them at like 150 bucks <clears throat> or 200 bucks I think and I was like oh like I was like freaking out in my in my in my apartment because I, I made 200 bucks on on a laptop within like five minutes and I started like in my mind, I was like, holy crap. I was like 200 bucks in five minutes. That's equal to somebody working basically 10 hours. I was like, I got to figure this out. And so then I started, I really just started going into business mode and I promoted it on social media like over and over again. And it really just started taking off. I started like tracking my numbers on a calendar and I told my girlfriend, I was like, I was like, I just made 500 bucks a day, 500 bucks. Can you believe that? And like, she couldn't register it. And I was like trying to tell her, I was like, okay, look, 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 look. I was like, this is the plan. Okay. If I keep this momentum going, I'm going to make enough money. I, I don't have to go to college. I'm going to keep doing this business. All right. You, you stay in college. I'm going to stay here. I just won't do college. I'm going to work on the business. We graduate. We've got a house. Life goes on. Money is not a problem. How's that sound? And she didn't believe it. Like she thought it was just kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Calm down. You know, I, I know you got your college your college energy going, you're so excited for something that you don't even know what you're getting into. And I, and I can understand it, right? If it's a guy, if a guy's like that, there's a lot of, a lot of stories like that, but we were dating for four years through this whole thing from high school through college, everything. And when this time happened, like I was really getting my momentum back because I saw that this thing has actually literally saved people's lives. And if it saved people's lives with tumors that were worse than mine, I was like, okay, I can do this. Like I can be a one percenter whose life 
get saved and change forever. And I'm now making money through a business I've always wanted to do in my entire life. Like, holy crap, this is literally like the world coming to reality that I've always wanted. And then suddenly Saturday morning, I get the longest text of my life that I'm, I mean, it's literally as if I'm reading a 10 page book over text message. And she ended up breaking up with me over a text message on a Saturday morning. And I never saw her again. And that was four years dating and never saw her again. And so that was, that was honestly, I know it sounds a little bit crazy. Okay. But it was honestly more depressing at the time than honestly getting diagnosed. Um, because I was like, I was, I was here, hit rock bottom. Then I was coming back up and then I hit really rock bottom. Wow. And so I called my mom. I said, mom, this is what's happening. I'm making solid money. I said, I don't know what to do. Do I stay in college and just go through all the BS stuff or do I work on my business and drop out and come home and stay with you guys? She was like, I'll be there tomorrow morning, pack up your stuff. You're coming home. And I was like, okay. So I literally ended up moving out within 12 hours that next day. Um, and that was a very life changing moment because I packed up, I was making great money, very depressing, right? And I'm so glad I was able to go live with my family just to make enough money to then go live downtown. Um, but as time went by, the business really started taking off. I started going massively viral and I was able to go live on my own at 21 years old downtown. And it was such a, such an eye opening time and kind of going, bringing, bringing this back into business. So long story short, but the guy who told me about the ketogenic diet was a huge mentor of mine. And he ended up wanting to be part of my business because he ended up seeing how well it was going and what I was doing. And I started making literally, I ended up, I ended up get, I had like, I think a hundred thousand dollars in my bank account at 21. And I was like, wow. Oh my God. I was like freaking out. And he saw that he knew how well it was going. So he was like wanting to be part of it. And of course, if he's a mentor of mine all the way through high school, he's already been very successful. I had no questions. I was like, yep, you're on board. What do you want? So he wanted a 65, 35, <clears throat> no, excuse me, 60, 40. <clears throat> um, he wanted 40% of the business, 60% to me. I didn't know any legal stuff. I'm literally two weeks into the real world. I didn't have a lawyer. I just trusted the guy. I was like, yeah, sign this. Okay, cool. Sign that. Sure. Let's go make money. Let's do it. And I ended up giving him 40% of my business. And then literally within the entire year, he invested zero dollars. He put in maybe less than an hour of work every month. I saw him every other month. We lived in the same city. He traveled to South Africa, lived over there for six months, didn't do jack squat. And I'm literally in my apartment just hacking away every single day, just trying to make freaking money to just like grow, grow, grow. And I was so young, so new. And <clears throat> I was putting my blood, sweat and tears. And then I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm making all this money. He gets nearly half of the money that I make. He doesn't do jack squat. I do everything and I can't get rid of him. And if I get rid of him, I've got to literally give him all the money that I've made to buy him out. So it was a very disheartening time um, in the first year of business when it was going massively well. So like all that money that I basically made just went back to zero almost at 21. And in that time period, there was this guy on Instagram um, and he kept messaging me. He was like, hey, bro, like, you know, my name is Garvin, like, blah, 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 blah. I feel like I could really help you out in this, 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 whatever, whatever. And I was like, no, nah, dude, I got a lot of things going on. Appreciate it. Literally every week, hey, dude, my name is Garvin. I can blah, 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 blah. This is this, this whatever. I was like, dude, I don't have time. Like, thank you. I, I, it's not going to work. And he literally kept coming back probably every other week for six months straight of wanting an opportunity. And I've never met the guy. The guy lived in Ireland. So how am I supposed to trust this guy if I can't even trust the guy who was a mentor of mine? And I don't know what it was. Something, it could have been the most stupid decision or it could have been the best decision, right? It's a 50-50 shot. So at the end of the year, I ended up having to get rid of my business partner. It was a very emotional moment because I really looked up to him. I, I massively respected him. And I ended up bringing this guy on. And the guy said, look, 65-35 revenue share, no legal stuff, Okay nothing at all. Don't pay me a dime until the end of the month. Okay. I'm going to do A, B, C, D all the way through. Don't pay me until the end of the month, whatever that revenue is 35%. And that's it. You write me the check. All money goes to your bank account. So I was like, okay, nothing to lose. Right. So in that first month, <clears throat> it went massively well, second month, incredibly well, and so on and so forth. And we've been working together now for six years. 
and we've only hung out one time, dude, for two hours straight. And that's it. Um, and we chat every single day. So like, it's the, it was one of the best decisions of my life of saying yes to that. It could have been the worst, but who knows? Right. And so now we've built, uh, two six figure coaching businesses, now a seven figure coaching business. And, uh, it's been a crazy journey. Um, it's like, I'm the most unlucky, but lucky guy that there ever is. So, (laughs) wow. Well, what a story. And I hope he's watching so he knows how appreciated he is. Yeah. If anything, this will post to the channel for folks who want to see afterwards. But um, what a story from rock bottom to um, a new summit, building multiple coaching businesses to six and seven figures. Um, adversity is a core theme that you have uh, dealt with in your life. You had the worst kind of brain uh, cancer. You had a devastating breakup with a woman you loved that you dated for four years, you had your mentor who you trusted um, in other words, basically screw you over, right? It seems like you've been able to overcome adversity to be wildly successful. And I know you wrote a a book as well. Um, Is that part of the core theme of the book? Could you talk about that, the book and uh, there it is. Perfect. Uh, (laughs) Can you talk about that and, and how you ended up like, what's the mindset, the tools to overcome adversity at this magnitude. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's the quote of it. It always seems impossible until it is done by Nelson Mandela, right? Like, okay, go build a business. But then our natural mind thinks it's impossible. Go start a YouTube channel, but our natural mind thinks it's impossible. Like it's easier to think negatively than it is positively. So I've had to literally train myself like, Hey, doctor said you'll be dead. And that's easy to listen to, especially from a doctor who's world-class top, top level. But it's you, okay? You have to listen to yourself before you listen to anybody else. So I had to literally train myself and understand that like each step through the entire process is one step closer to achieving the life I want. And a lot of times people go into things like this where they're like, oh man, I want to achieve my dreams. Like I want to be a millionaire, but I'm depressed right now. I've got anxiety. I don't know what to do. I don't know who I am. I'm not good at this. I'm not like him. I'm not like her, right? So it's like a snowball effect of reasons why they're never going to get there. But my biggest advice is, See the whole picture all together. And what I mean by that is start at step one. And step one does not have to be, okay, now I'm going to start meditating, running, sprinting, reading, writing, business building, this, this, and this. Just start with literally one thing and that's it. And I call it a three a three goal structure. And basically what I do is every year, I've got three specific goals that I only focus on. And every month is a step closer in that. So any task that I ever do in the day is going to contribute to one of my three goals that'll get me close to my bigger vision. So for now, it's my online coaching business to scale it. Then I'm going to, I'm going to focus on my YouTube channel to really grow that. And then I'm going to scale it, building my public speaking to hit a certain number of revenue through that. And those are the only three things that I ever focus on. Now there's other things in this little triangle that I call that will contribute to each other, which can be, you know, in the middle, it could be proper sleep. It could be, you know, reading this book. It could be, you know, watching this, but it all contribute to that. My biggest advice is literally see it all together and take one step. Don't look at a million different things at once. Yeah. You know, that is such an insightful and helpful mindset. And I love your focus. And by the way, I hear my dog chewing something. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh there's, she's chewing my glasses. That's okay. I was freaking out. Um, but Oh, it, so it sounds like um, you also had habits beyond, you know, the mindset and in your goal setting, and the way you approach that you had habits that helped you um, recover your health. And you mentioned keto, which was a huge part of it. Are there any other core habits that led you to become such a uh, high performer? Yeah, um, man, dude, it's I don't want to it's not really a habit. It's more of like it's more fear. Okay. Fear is not always bad. Everyone's got fear, but again, you've got two options. Okay. You, you either do nothing and the fear wins every time, or you do something and you get closer to beating the fear. So my fear was honestly, I know it sounds crazy. I've I've never been broke, but I don't know what it was is I've always seen people on the side of the road. I've heard people, I don't have money. Can you help? And I always feared that. And if I always feared that, I literally had to attack it. I just, I could never run from it. So if you have that sort of thing happening to you, you've got to understand, okay, I, I fear blank. 
And a lot of times as men, entrepreneurs, whatever, we're like, no, I don't have fear. No, forget that. Like I'm, 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 I'm tough. Like stay tough and strong. No. Okay. That's BS. Like everybody has fear. I don't care how successful you are. Everyone has fear, but some people do attack it. Some people don't attack it. Every time you face that fear, that fear is moving backwards and you're moving forward. You want, one thing you mentioned as well is that, um, pressure makes diamonds, right? Um, I love that expression. It seems foundational to you. Um, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on what that actually means and how it can be applied. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, okay, I'm an AB student. All right. If I tried harder, sure. I could probably make all A's, but I'm just no, I'm no natural, like show me the math test and I'm making A's regardless. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just, I'm not that type, but I'm definitely the type that can handle the failures. And the most successful people are not the people who are the most intelligent, not the people who are the most skilled, not the people who have read the most books. It's simply the people who can handle the most amount of pressure and still keep going. The people who can handle the most failures, the people who can handle the most doubt, the most fear, the most everything. And if you look at the most successful people, right, there's Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Nick Saban, LeBron James. Every one of those people have has gone through serious pressure. They've They've lost Super Bowls. They've lost national championships. They've lost NBA finals, but they still have kept going with the same exact mindset regardless. And what's very interesting is it's more difficult to, to, to win a championship and then win another championship. Why? Because if you win one, you become, you know, satisfied. Well, I basically kind of did it. And then they kind of, you know, half ass it. But these individuals have always done the one thing. Okay, all Nick Saban, Tom Brady, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, they've all done one specific thing. And they let go of the past regardless. They learn from it, but they let it go. Like one bad game, one bad sales call. Mm. They never go back and think about that. They learn from it, but they don't think of like, man, I'm so pissed because if I would have literally just like did this one play, like I would have won the Super Bowl. If I said this one, like, you know, word on this sales call, dude, I think they would have changed their mind. Like, they don't look at that. They look at, okay, well, who's the next one? Next one. Next one. What's, what's good? Right? They keep the same energy at every single step, regardless of what happened on the one before. Wow. You know, I heard a Tony Robbins expression, and it's not word for word, but I don't care what happened 10 years ago, 10 months ago, 10 weeks ago, 10 days ago, 10 seconds ago. You're not your past. Let's move forward and let's get going. Yeah. Um, so you faced hate, haven't you? Oh, yeah. it's dramatic, right? Um, you know, I think that I have a quote, and it, my buddy gave me a, a gift. Uh, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. It's a quote of his about the haters. I think. Yeah. Um, and as it seems, as you get successful, like you've gone viral, you'll experience hate, right? Um, even amazing people like Brene Brown. She talks about vulnerability and being courageous. So sweet. She get, has gotten. I think she's gotten death threats. Don't quote me. She's at least gotten hate. I'm sure. How have you dealt with that? Man, dude, I'm not, I, I definitely have to say this. I am a very emotional person. It has its benefits, it's non-benefits, right? You show me a motivational video, I'm out there running 10 miles because I'm so excited. But if something bad does happen or if I get hate or if somebody thinks I'm whatever, it does, it does emotionally like trigger me. Yeah. Um, and I did, I did get hate from the very beginning when keto was something that people didn't know about. They thought it was like fake. And I was literally one of the first persons on Instagram to use hashtag keto. I'm not, I'm not making this up. And I was getting so much hate. And so at first I started rethinking everything. I'm like, okay, maybe they're right. Maybe this is fake. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm a scam artist. Who knows? Maybe I just don't know anything what I'm talking about. Maybe they're right. Right. So like over time, I started, I started looking at it from, not from the standpoint of like, okay, go fight them, go fight them. I looked at it from the standpoint of like, to going from here to now looking at it here. Like why, why are they giving that hate? And if you look at the why behind why people are giving you hate, it's because of their past, of things that have happened to them. They have not, they were not raised in a structured family. They did not have a father figure or a mother figure. They have been bullied in their own past. They are jealous of what you're doing. They don't know what they want. And they find it easier to try and bring people down than to push themselves themselves up. So when I look at it like that, I'm like, wow, that is actually a way different vision. So I don't hate the people that hate me because I know they hate themselves. So me hating them is not going to solve any problem for me or for them. So I just know that they hate themselves, right? They hate you. They chase you. And when you look at it like that, it's as simple as that. And that's how I've been able to overcome that. 
um, just looking at it from a different outside view. Yeah, what a perspective. And again, when you get hate, that's a sign of success. It really is. So I wanted to ask a few more questions on handling adversity and yeah. you're on the bottom. And then I'd like to finish off digging more into your entrepreneurship journey and coaching journey. Yeah. So one of my core life themes, and if I were to give a talk, one day I'd love to give a TED talk and be on how we can turn problems into opportunities. I really think that this one line, I'm, I might have gotten it from someone, but uh, life is like a cat. Take two. Life is like a tapestry. On the back, it's chaotic and full of knots, but without those knots, you don't get the beautiful image on the front. Do you have you seen that your problems have been some of your biggest opportunities in your life? Oh yeah. Again, like problem with my business partner turned into the best decision I've ever been able to make. Right. The, the, the biggest, like the biggest breakup, ended up becoming like the best thing that's happened to me because I now I had no choice but to go literally go build the life I wanted, right? My whole diagnosis, I don't think that we'd be doing this podcast or this episode, right? If I didn't have that, I don't think I would know you, right? Maybe I would just be, you know, doing a regular job and living in Cedar Park, Texas or something. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe we'd never have known each other. Um, yeah. Your book wouldn't have existed. Exactly. And the impact that you've been able to make for other people exactly. and to inspire people. I, I'm very inspired myself in this conversation and I know you and it's like, I'm re-inspired. And, you know, Jordan Peterson spoke recently in Austin and he yeah. is someone who I really admire, brilliant guy. And he said, our problems are a call to adventure and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So thanks for sharing that perspective of how those three monster problems yeah. turned into opportunities. Hopefully it edifies the audience, uh, whatever they're, they may be going through in their life. Um, the final question around adversity is you mentioned in a conversation a long time ago, you said, Chris, when I, um, you basically had gotten rid of the tu tumor, you would visualize, didn't you do have visualization exercises? Uh, um, to as a preventative measure in a way, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Can you yeah. talk about how you use visualization in your life? Yeah. As you know? So if you, if, if, if people on here have watched the movie, uh, Mr. Incredible, right. Um, there's a superhero, I forget the name of the superhero, but she has like a purple shield around her and this purple shield, uh, basically protects her from anything that comes her way. So like anybody wants to come try and shoot her, stab her, whatever, boom, block, nothing happens. So I visualize myself when I meditate of this big shield in front of me and around me. And then I visualize the tumor that I was diagnosed with in front of me outside of that shield. Wow. Visualize it in front of me, not in me, right? If I think about it in me, that's not going to help the journey, right? It's going to give me more fear that it's coming back. But if I visualize it outside of me, it's gone. I'm just looking at it. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I can visualize a fear of my business falling apart. I can visualize a fear of, I don't know who knows like anything that I've ever feared or I've been traumatized by. And if I visualize it in front of me outside of that shield, that's, that's not me, right? That's not in me. That's outside of me. And this is me inside of me. I know it sounds complicated, but that's what I, visualize. Oh. and it massively has given me confidence in, in nearly anything that I've been like, you know, traumatized with or that I've feared in my life. And it's kind of given me a slap back to the fear than rather than the fear just slapping me all the time. Wow. So you've used the visualization as a shield from your fears. Um, how have you used visualization um, around your specific goals? You know, people talk about manifesting things. I'd love to know about that. And again, uh, I am going to take my glasses for my puppy. Yeah, She's go for it, go for it. Probably destroyed, but it's freaking me out. So I'd love to hear your answer to that question, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, you want me to wait for you or you want to? I'll, I'll wait for you. She is so cute though, but uh, got a little little damage on the oh, on the glasses, but we're okay. Yeah. So, how have you used visualization um, to really manifest monster goals? Yeah. Dude, so, I, I I visualize the goals that I want. I want to hit 300k a month in my online coaching business. I want to hit 100k subscribers this year, a million, you know, in less than five years. And then I want to make 20k a month in public speaking. And what I do is I take 10 minutes or five to 10 minutes here, five to 10 minutes here, five to 10 minutes here. And I think of every single one of them. I visualize, you know, I th I literally think of my bank account, looking at my laptop, $300,000 in the month of March, whatever. Like I literally visualize that. I think of every little piece of going onto a sales call and the guy says, yes, I'm ready to sign up. Great. 
And then I visualize a sale every single day at 10,000 a piece, right? And I visualize these things so vividly, like it's like as I'm meditating, like I'm actually living it. It takes practice, but it does it does work. And then I visualize, you know, 100,000 subscribers. I visualize a video doing super well. I visualize actually making the video. And then I shift over and I'll visualize actually being on stage, like actually getting people to stand up, standing ovation, loving it, you know, all these sort of things. And I just literally do that every single day and just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And because I've done it so many times, I'm so utterly confident that I will get there. I 100% will get there. I have no doubt about that. I don't know if it's tomorrow, if it's next month, if it's next oh, year, but it'll, it'll happen, right? So when you do that, you, you become so much more confident on a daily basis in who you really are. And I was not so confident back then because I feared that I would not achieve it because I didn't visualize it. If I don't visualize it and experience it before it's actually achieved, then I probably will never get there. So that's why I do this every single day. And dude, it's life changing, like absolutely life changing. So. And by sharing it with me and even the audience, that's something that I learned about in a personal growth seminar that they would call enrollment. It's mm -hmm. like you speak it into existence through language and it, it shows up in the listing of people and it comes alive and almost, it almost becomes it, like you have to do it because yeah. I remember when I got my job at Google, it, I hit an unexpected hiring freeze and one is unemployed for six months um, because I left my job prematurely, even though I made it through the interviews. And I didn't expect it just long story short, I was unemployed for six months with a chance of it falling through because the Google operations team said, hey, we're cutting off hiring for now. So we can't give Chris the official offer. And um, <sighs> In that time, um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought, Logan. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, you're basically we're, we're going, we're going, we're going back to like visualization. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm human, guys. You know, human moment here. But I use that concept of enrollment and what you're doing of sharing. Like uh, I had told so many people I was going to Google, and even in the time that was it, it led to unemployment, where the dream almost collapsed, it's there was like a necessity to it, and I still proclaimed it. It was so crazy. Yeah. I think there's power to that is all I'm saying. hundred percent there is dude. Cause it's power in yourself, right? It's the biggest thing. No one's going to change your life for you. No one's going to make you a millionaire. It's only you. So you got to believe it. Amen, brother. I feel like I'm at the church of uh, <laughs> inspiration. Now <laughs> this is so great on a Friday as we kick into the weekend. Now let's finish up talking about um, your path in entrepreneurship. One of my first high level questions is what are some of the key lessons that you've learned building um, businesses to six, seven figures or on, on this entrepreneur entrepreneurship journey, what have been some of the core lessons you've learned? Cut your ego and learn from the best. Cause I was a 21 year old. I made a hundred thousand dollars. I thought I was the biggest and the baddest thought I knew it all. I was like, if I made that money at 21 easy. I know it all. But in reality, I literally knew like maybe 10% of, of everything that I ever needed to know. So if I cut my ego earlier, I could become a millionaire faster, right? And it's just understanding that you're not the best at everything. You've got to learn from the best. Okay. My next thing is, is it's so cliche, so cliche, but you have to keep your goals simple and patient. And if you don't actually enjoy going from A to Z, and you're just so desperate for Z, if you don't actually enjoy getting there, then it's not a goal that you should pursue. Right. You've got to absolutely love every single piece of it. And, and in that process, there's going to be boring work. There's going to be work that nobody wants to do. You can say, yeah, well, I, I, I know I can find something that won't have any boring work. Good luck. It, it, will, it won't. If you want to make real money, it's not going to be there. Yep. It's not going to it's not going to exist. So you've got to understand that you've got to enjoy that boring work. And thirdly, again, so, so cliche, but like you have to be patient. I, I, I seriously, I was so stressed at such a young age. I was like, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got to make, you know, uh, you know, 200,000 a year by 22. And I know if I don't, like, I'm a failure. Like, dude, like it was, so, <laughs> it was so stressful, dude. And like, it's good to put yourself under pressure, but don't like stop, stop thinking so much about the future and so much about the past. Mm. If you dominate your mindset of thinking about right now, like what do I have to do right now and today to progress one step closer to my goal? If you do that every single day, you will 100% get there. 
But again, if you're so focused on the future, you're absolutely stressed out. If you're so focused on the past, you're absolutely going through so much anxiety and fear. So literally in the moment is the 100% best thing you could possibly do. Amazing. So how big a part has um, sales played in your success? Oh, dude. Uh, I'll never forget. I started fitpreneuracademy.com is when I was helping people create their online fitness nutrition coaching business. And I'll never forget. I, I was trying to get people to sign up and I get on the call. Not, not interested. I'm good. I was like, okay. Okay. And it's like my first sales call ever. I didn't even know, like I knew how to convince people. I didn't know how to do actual sales. And so this thing kept happening. I was like, you know what? I was like, I hate sales. Like this, this sucks. Like, yeah, I'm not doing this. I'm going to get somebody else to do it. I'm just going to do my content thing. And that's it. I'm not doing sales. And then I was like, dude, okay. Why? Like you're just trying to run from something that you're not good at. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand that if you're not good at it, don't run from it. Get good at it. So I said, all right, all right, Logan, look, dude, you're going to spend a year, two years, whatever it takes for you to become really freaking good at sales and absolutely love it. And I was like, all right, day one. And I just went gung ho for a year and a half, and just literally just got as good as I possibly could at sales. And it was absolutely life changing. And I'm not done. Like, I, I absolutely love it. Like, I'm always trying to get better. And so getting good at sales was an absolute life changing thing. I mean, people on here that are watching, they probably do sales. Yeah. Or you're working on it. It's the number one skill that I'm going to tell my kids you've got to get good at. I don't, your, your degree does not have to be in sales, but I'm just saying you have to know sales. If you want to be successful socially, financially, job wise, business wise, relationship, whatever, you got to get good at sales. And so I started in tech sales out of college at Oracle and they have a training program. Yeah. So I was fortunate. You were in the school of hard knocks in as an entrepreneur on your own. How did you learn sales? Like what resources did you turn to? Cause this could be helpful to anyone out there trying to build their own, like say coaching business or be a solo entrepreneur. <laughs> don't, don't do what I did. Okay. okay. I, I did it the hard way. All right. I just, sir, I heard no a million times. I had a million flakers. I had so many objections that I just was like, Oh, okay. All right. Well, cool. All right. Maybe next time. See ya. Like I just thought that's what you did. So I did it the absolute hard way and I got good at it. But I would say this, that get a sales coach. Like it could be a good friend who's really freaking good at sales in your industry or just get somebody who's really good at sales. Get a Jordan Belfort program, right? Look up Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. Like he has the highest level sales method, right? Look up his book, Wolf of Wall Street and read the freaking book. And it t teaches you his whole process of the loop method of what loops are, what objections are, you know, tone, you know, energy, all these sort of things are, and just literally like, keep it simple. Jordan Belfort sales program or get his, his book, Wolf of Wall Street. And it can literally be life changing for you. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that because the final thing I was going to ask you about um, sales is uh, what are some concrete tactics you use to close over the phone? I know uh, you described when you got your first $200 sale in 10 minutes through your laptop. I and mean, that is pretty powerful. And in a ver it's amazing our potential to make money in a virtual world. Um, I had a uh, fitness instructor that reached out to me on LinkedIn from Ohio and he trained me virtually and got amazing results. He designed my programming. So there's this, a huge opportunity to capture. How do you close virtually or over the phone or over uh, Google Meet or a Zoom? Yeah, dude, I just, I'm really good at connecting with the people. I'm really good. I'm not good at selling. I'm good at solving. Because if you solve a problem for somebody, if you solve a problem for a company and you say, is this a solution that you feel would help? Yeah, I do. Okay, so you, do you feel the solution is worth making an investment in to help 10x your sales and your business? Yeah, I do. Okay, so is this something you feel that you're ready for? Yeah, I do. So you didn't, I, didn't, I didn't convince them. I just asked them a question. And so I got really good at connecting with people. And I got really, really good at getting away from the standard method of sell, selling to now the future way of selling. And here's where I'm going with that. Sales have become 10 times more difficult nowadays than they have back in the day. The reason is because back in the day, you could actually convince somebody and they'd buy what you're trying to sell because you're convincing them. But nowadays, you cannot convince them because they have there's technology to look you up. There's reviews online. 
their social media to see if you're the real deal. They have so many more varieties to look at this coach, that coach, this tech company, that tech company. So they have so many things to dissect to prove why they shouldn't buy from you. So you have to stop convincing. You have to connect. And if you start connecting with them and they actually do feel a connection with you, they're going to get off that call and they're going to start looking you up and seeing how great of a person you are or how great of the company is rather than thinking of like, hmm, they just try to convince me. Let me see the real reviews about this company here. You know what I'm saying? So you got to genuinely connect and just stop selling and start solving and it's going to 100% change the game for you. So, Wait, are we connecting right now? Yeah. Well, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> I'm sold. Sign me up. But um, <laughs> one, one thought I had and I've seen in my experience in sales is um, it's nice to, to empower um, potential uh, clients or what I call prospects with information. Like give them, we, I want to give you the information to make the best decision for you um, and being consultative. And another thing I noticed is, um, I mean, people do buy emotionally. Psychology is really a play in sales. So, you know, understanding uh, a challenge that um, a prospect is trying to overcome in their life or a goal they want to move towards, I, I've seen is important. What are your thoughts on that? Have, and have you seen that play out um, psychologically in your uh, type of selling? Oh, absolutely. And I'm stupidly confident in what I sell. So again, I'm not trying to convince people. I'm just trying to have them visualize that problem being solved. I'm literally trying to have them think, think about this problem. Okay. It's hurting you, you know, emotionally, financially, yeah. time-wise. Think about it. It sucks. Does it not? Oh yeah, it sucks. Okay. And so from you to get from this island to this island, I have this, I have a literally a perfect path for you to solve that problem. hundred percent guaranteed or money back or money back guaranteed. Do you feel that this is the solution for you? And how would that, how would you like, what would that do for you? And if they literally visualize that, and if they actually see the proof that my solution works, I would, I would want them to sign up, not because I care about their money, but because I know what I do. I know it works. And I know if they do the work, it's going to hundred percent change the game for them. And I've been able to change so many lives in this online coaching to where people have been able to quit their nine to five. People have been able to quit, wow. you know, doing a personal training thing or, They've had a, a non-successful business now becomes, you know, insanely successful and it literally has changed their life. And so when it changes people's life, I'm like, it works. Okay. You want the solution? I'm telling you it is going to work. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. So that's why, again, I do trigger their emotions in a positive way to get them to see the solution that I have. Because naturally people can have a closed mind, especially in the online coaching world. Like, oh, I've seen coaches. I've seen this offer. So naturally they've got a closed mind as reasons to not sign up with you. But if I have them really visualize it and see how it's different and how much I really care about the results, they start thinking of like, hmm, okay, this is different. And I am open to hearing about how this could solve that. So, Yeah. One thing I thought of um, as well is uh, I, I wanted to actually, um, you know, I'm going to go in a different direction just to finish up on the sales piece. Because, yeah. um, you know, I realize um, – you know, you probably get a run on a Friday. Um, I'm going to a Kygo concert tonight, by the way. So oh, nice. Are you a Kygo fan? Mm, what is that? So he, he's like an electronic, like, DJ. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a, a link after. But I wanted to ask you about the Jordan Belfort. Um, uh, you said loop or something. Could you at least at a high level describe the, the technique or whatever that is? Yeah, so he calls it the, the, the loop method, right? You get on a call. And they're like, okay, how much is it? It's $10,000. You ready? Oh, God, that's a lot of money. Blah, 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 blah. Talk to my spouse. Not sure if I can afford this. Yada, 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 yada. Okay, then I bring in a loop. Okay, so here's what I'm willing to do. Okay, on top of the $10,000 you know, offer that I'm, I'm giving you at a $5,000 off discount, I'm also going to offer that my team will build out your landing page for you. This costs an extra $3,000 for my clients. But today, today only, I'm going to add that in for you for free. How's that sound? Wow. Okay, that's a pretty good deal. But what what if I what if I don't see the results? What if things just don't go my way? And that's the only thing I'm kind of nervous about. Okay. So here's the deal. I do have a hundred percent money back guarantee that I'm willing to give you today and a full landing page done for you that's three thousand dollars, but I'm giving it to you for free and five thousand dollar off discount at ten thousand dollars. And I can only offer this today only because this is so exclusive for my business. And if they, don't, if they don't say yes at these times, right, these are loops, these are add-ons, 
And let's say that God forbid, like they don't say yes, or they got to talk to their spouse or whatever. And you have to come back and do a follow-up call from the follow from the time of that call ends to the follow-up call in between there, you can add another loop. Hey, you know, talk to my business partner. Not only are we going to give you a discount, not only are we going to give you built done for you landing page and a money back guarantee, but I'm also going to add in blank. And this is an exclusive offer. I never do this for anybody. I'll do it for you. We'll chat Monday. I'll see you then. And that's another loop. So these are always add on bonuses. If they don't accept these, which they probably will accept it on loop one or two or three, but they're getting closer and closer to reasons to buy in. Right. So as you're doing this and it's not, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Like I don't recommend doing like, Oh, discount. Okay. Discount, discount, discount. You know, don't do yeah. that. Just add in different little things that gets their mind thinking about why they should do it. And that's what will really get people closer. That's really helpful because that's a technique I'd never learned. So I'm sure, you know, for the audience, it's a, a new insight that they could probably apply today or tomorrow as they yeah. uh, sell themselves and build their businesses. The, yeah. the thought that I lost that I wrangled in again, I've had that happen a couple of times today is um, just to our uh, point or discussion on, um, you know, helping the client or prospect understand emotionally uh, the cost to them or what the benefits would look like. I feel like it's, it's good to get them, you know, thinking like, yeah, like what, it, what is it costing you to stay on the same trajectory? Right. And really maybe you can quantify it or um, paint a picture emotionally and to get them to visualize like having achieved their goal, you know, what that would look like. That was just something that I, I thought of. Do you, do you get them to, I, I guess not being in like, you don't want to be over the top with it, but do you apply those techniques or get them to like visualize? <laughs> oh, dude, I, 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 I lay out facts. I say, okay, yeah. so how much are you making right now in your online coaching business? A thousand a month. Okay. So how many hours are you putting in on a monthly basis? Uh, 50 hours. Okay. So doing some math here, I'd have to do math. I don't remember what that number is. Thousand dollars, yeah. 50. What is that? Like two, yeah, 20. I don't, I don't know. I'm terrible at math. Friday, you know. Whatever, whatever. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you're making about $10 an hour right now doing this, making $1,000 a month. How does that sound? Right. So if you're making $10 an hour, right, I mean, that's lower than the average income. And if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep making $10 an hour at $2,000 a month or $1,000 a month. But what I can do is I can not only help you cut your hours down, to be able to still have the job that you have and get closer to doing this full time. But in those hours that are cut down, your time is going to be worth more. So now you're, cause you know what to do and you're actually seeing better results. So now when you went from 50 hours a month to now 25 hours a month, and now, now you're making 5,000 a month. So now your hourly rate and building your business went up to $50 an hour. So because of that, do you see the difference there? Like would it make yeah. sense for you to keep, and I'm just like doing this as I'm talking to them, like, do you see, would you rather keep making 10 bucks an hour working 50 hours a month or would you rather make 50 bucks an hour working 25 hours a month? And so when they start thinking that, they're like, shoot, I never thought of that. And that's what gets them closer to like wanting to proceed with that. Yeah. And nice use of a hypothetical scenario. You know, you give two options and it's like, of course, you know, practically speaking, you choose the better option. So um, again, another helpful look under the hood on some of the techniques you might use to close that other people could apply. Okay. This is basically the final question for you. Final question or two. Could you talk a little bit about your business? Isn't it simplified scaling? Yeah. Yeah. It's simplified a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's helping people scale their online coaching business in the most simple way possible. I help them systemize literally 90% of their business. I help them scale through YouTube ads. I have a lead generating software. I help them scale through um, building out a sales team. I help them scale through the hiring process and literally have a full funnel process that's already templated, ready to go. They just fill in, boom, done. Literally helps their sales massively. So helping them scale to seven figures in the most simple way, time, stress-free way possible. Wow. And that's a key challenge for people is they can maybe experience some traction and success, but scaling is a whole different uh, story. Yeah. And you basically help these entrepreneurs um, – amplify their results like substantially and that could be life-changing so yeah. um my final uh, question before a call to action for people to get connected with you and uh, check you out is can you give a teaser of some of the concepts like uh, just a little taste of some operating principles or tools that are uh, most helpful to scale uh, for example a coaching business 
Yeah. Um, you mean like other softwares, things to use? Maybe it's not because you mentioned some tools, high, high level, like lead generation and other um, key aspects like building a sales team. But are there any, when we look at the concept of scaling a business, like are there some core principles and concepts that um, you've applied and obviously you're, you're sharing with your your um, clients? Yeah, you got you to look at it from a time a time timetable, right? Where are you putting the most amount of your time? And if you're putting your time into, into like, 70% of your time into generating leads, ask yourself, could this be taught to somebody else? And if it can be taught to somebody else, you hire somebody to do it for you. And that now gives you back 70% of your time to now focus on things that you can't hire people for, which could be an example of building out your program, making it better, helping clients, uh, running YouTube ads, right? You can't have somebody else create the videos because the video has to be you. So then you put your time over there. Then, or your time could go into building a sales team where now these people are taught how to prospect, close, prospect, close. Now they're getting sales, right? So look at it at a time window. Can you have somebody do this work for you and you can teach them? And if so, change your time and put it over here that's gonna help scale it. And so I kind of teach them that sort of process. So it sounds like a foundational principle and concept is delegating where possible, especially around tasks that are not super differentiated to you. Of course, you need to be the one, you have the unique messaging and you deliver and, and are, are filmed and communicate your message. And it's hard to, I mean, that's you and that's unique, but everything else can be delegated and that helps free up your time to focus on the highest value tasks. Is that yep. fair to say? 100% work smarter, not harder. Absolutely. So Logan, this has been an incredible conversation. Even though I know you, I feel like I got to know you yeah. better. I learned a lot myself. I know the audience got a lot out of this too. Um, and to the audience out there, make sure to give this, uh, this video a, a, a like. Um, it helps show uh, the video to more people. You know, the algorithm loves that. And I think a lot of people out there could benefit from this message. I want to finish with um, you know, a call to action, Logan, around where people can get connected with you on your socials, how they could check out um, uh, uh, Simplified Scaling. Um, would love to yeah. hear you on that. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube, Logan Sneed. I got like 900 subscribers. I have two channels. I'm deleting one of them, but 900 okay. subscriber one. Um, or look me up on Instagram, Logan Sneed, and you'll see me on there. So Perfect. And again, the business, if they want to check you out, um, I guess they would find you on the socials and, and, and you would have uh, a link to your business there. Yeah, or simplifiedscaling.co. Okay. And then finally, the book. Yeah. Yeah. Look it up on Amazon. It's called Thank You Cancer. And you'll see it on there. Perfect. So I will link all the socials, your book, um, your website for your business. You know, thank you for your time. Do you have any final uh, thoughts before we, we sign off? A successful warrior is an average man with laser like focus. Simple as that. So all you warriors out there, you know, we're wishing you the best wild success in tech sales and entrepreneurship and in life. Of course, again, make sure to subscribe to the channel, um, you know, for weekly sales, mental health and personal growth hacks that you can join like snacks. And we will talk to you soon. Logan, thank you so much. Cool. Appreciate it, man.